Hello and welcome to Arts and Tim Ministries Artist Forum. Does God care about art? Now, that's a very basic question in one sense, and some artists might just say, well, God's the creator, he created everything, then he made us in his image. And that's true, but that's not really specifically about art. That may be creativity in science or engineering or in education, a host of areas in life that that applies to, not specifically art. And my passion here is to help artists, people in the mainstream or within the church, get real clarity on how God views them as artists and the art they create. And we've done this for decades. My wife and I are both artists, and I'm an ordained minister, ordained since 2000, and this is our passion. So thank you for joining us, and I hope this is encouraging to you. Leave any comments down below, like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. But right now, I really want to encourage you. This is based on a forum we did online with artists, emerging and veteran artists around the world. And so I hope this topic is encouraging and gives you some principles to really lock onto. For too long, artists have felt relegated to the fringe of the Christian community. And honestly, it's pretty rare that you're a pastor encouraging people in the pew, you should go become an artist, go to New York, to LA, pursue a career in the arts, video games, film, TV, dancing. And, and part of the reason why is because our seminaries don't talk about art in the Bible. There's a growing awareness now, but it's still barely in its infancy as a serious topic for theologians. Usually when people think about art in the Bible, they get hung up on the issues of idolatry as forbidden in the Ten Commandments. In some denominations, this turns into a ban on any visual art in the sanctuary, even a cross. And for others, art is acceptable as long as it's basically propaganda. It's used to evangelize or to teach, so it's discipleship, like Sunday school class. And for others, uh, there's a weariness towards art that isn't explicitly a teaching aid or an aid in worship. They just can't imagine it being used by God outside. They've seen the excesses and the extremes, and because of that, they kind of hesitate, and they have a fear of, of really entering into all that art represents for a creativity, self-expression, and communicating in powerful ways. Now, in the middle of all this confusion, the one who lacks support and receives maybe undue criticism are the men and women creating art. And some artists have felt so far out of place in the church that they feel like they have to make a choice between their faith and their art. Sometimes an artist feels like, I, this is what I'm made for. I cannot not create. And so they leave the church and go pursue a career, LA, New York, London, Paris, wherever. And there are others who felt like, well, I've got to give up my art. And so they kind of kill this dream of being a professional artist because it just doesn't fit what they're hearing from the pulpit or in the pew, from friends, small group leaders. And so they give up the dream of pursuing art and they stay in the church. And I would submit to you, I do not think either option is glorifying God. That's not the way he meant us to experience life. The core issue is this. It doesn't need to be this way. Our faith should fuel our art and our creativity and art should be fueling our faith. And hear me on this clearly as a pastor. I've spoken on this issue for 20 years. I've been with pastors that are Calvary Chapel, Vineyard, Anglican, Presbyterian, Baptist, non-denominational. And each denomination has their own flavor, their own different things they're concerned about. But to be honest, when I give you these principles, the principles we taught, all these pastors have agreed with me. Now, this makes sense. We've just missed these verses in the theological discussions we've had and we haven't brought them to the people in the pew. So I encourage you, these are true and time-tested principles. So let's get to the heart of the matter. The God of the Bible does not relegate art or artists to the fringe of society, ever. In fact, art was at the very center of the nation of Israel from the beginning. Now here's a question I often ask audiences or congregations when I speak at churches or conferences. Do you know who the first person is who is filled with the Spirit of God in the Bible? The first person. Take a second. No, it's not Moses. It's not Adam. It's not Noah. It's not the first prophet Samuel. It's not the King David. It's none of those. It's an artist. That's right. The first person filled the Spirit of God in the Bible is an artist. We find him 
first mentioned in Exodus 31. Now, we all know the story of Moses getting the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, but the story we rarely hear from the pulpit is how God also told Moses who was to build the tabernacle, this work of art, and how they were to do it. The person God commissioned for this task was Bezalel and his right-hand man to Holiab, Exodus chapter 31, and God stated that he filled Bezalel with his spirit, gave him skill, ability, and knowledge for making all kinds of artwork and items in the tabernacle, including the famous Ark of the Covenant. Now this is significant for several key reasons. So God chose artists to play a special role in his divine plans. He had the Israelites bring their gold and silver, their precious jewels, and even though in the middle of the desert they don't have a permanent home, God said, make my home beautiful, adorn it with art, lavish expressions of creativity. So God chose artists to play a special role. He gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and then he also gave them Bezalel, so they had artwork to experience. And there was incense, there was smells, there was music, there were bells on the fringe of the robes, the priests. All your senses were being utilized to awaken you to the nature of who this God is. Second, God chose to use that art to transform an entire culture. They had been slaves and seen a culture of slavery to idolatry. And here God's saying, we're going to do things different. And one of the key people he uses is an artist. The third thing is artists and their work are an essential part of society. They're not on the fringe. From Mount Sinai, God calls Bezalel because Bezalel is critically important to his plan. All too often when we read Exodus, we tend to focus on God giving Moses Ten Commandments. We miss the fact that a third of the book is on artwork, which Bezalel was commissioned to create. I encourage you to read the whole book of Exodus and consider all the art and why was this so important to God and what does that mean for you as an artist. Now, my wife and I have taught on this subject for decades. We took the principles of how God used art and created four entire one-hour presentations, which are called the Bezalel Principles. They're the anchor and the foundation of our Arts and Entertainment Institute, which we've taught in Los Angeles and London to veteran artists, uh, Academy Award winner, Grammy winner, uh, you name it, academics, professors of art all around the country. And now we have it online, and we'll probably be launching that soon, so you can look out for that. But if you want to really delve deep and understand what God was saying through this one artist, then you need to check out that institute. I'll put a link uh, below this presentation. And we're going to understand the Bible. One of the big hang-ups here is the second commandment, thou shalt not make any graven images or worship them. And does that really forbid any artwork in the, in the temple? And the core crux of this is whatever the principle is that applies inside the temple, the Holy of Holies speaks clearly about God's character. If God despises artwork in the sanctuary, then that really has implications for the acceptability of art outside the sanctuary and in the mainstream culture. We have to understand that connection. And so we got to look at this issue of idolatry and examine scripture, what is really being said as compared to what you've heard from YouTube videos or, or different uh, speakers, well-intending uh, friends or family members. So let's jump in. God's second commandment, what does it say in Exodus 20? You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And this statue here is an example from Egypt. They were worshiping the sun god, the moon god, different animal sculptures, the pharaohs. All of these were different gods, and God's saying, I, that's not the way things are going to work here. I'm the only god in this new religion. But then look at Bezalel's commissioned art. This is the art for the tabernacle. God specifically required him to make. Bezalel is commissioned by God to make things that are both in heaven above and the earth below. And these are examples. Angels, blossoms, and pomegranates. So, angelic beings above and vegetation on earth. So, immediately like God speaking out of two sides of his mouth, saying, don't make any of these things. Bezalel, go and make them. Well, when there's tension in the Bible, there's a seeming contradiction or something we have a hard time understanding, 
we first we got to look at the immediate context and then the broader context of that book and then the Old Testament or New Testament and then the rest of the Bible. So let's do that and see what is really being said. Francis Schaeffer pointed out, at Mount Sinai, simultaneously God gave the Ten Commandments and commanded Moses to fashion a tabernacle in a way that which would involve almost every form of representational art that men have ever known. And some of it's not representational, actually. It's abstract, but Francis Schaeffer makes the point. So the question is, what does the Second Commandment really mean? Well, let's look at the original Hebrew words. Okay, Exodus 20, right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, do not make an idol. And then Exodus 25, 19, speaking about the tabernacle, make this tabernacle and its furnishings. The word here in both cases is make, the Hebrew asa, is the same word in both instances, and both of them are the imperative. So God is being, there's, there's no question, it's not a suggestion, this is the imperative. You have to do what I'm saying. You must not make idols, and you have to make the tabernacle and the furnishings and the angelic wings and the vegetation. So that didn't help. We got to look elsewhere. Let's look at the tabernacle art itself in more depth. First, there's make two cherubim of have hammered gold. So those are angel's wings. Make a lampstand of pure gold with flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms. So vegetation. Three, make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet. So here, it's already getting abstract and expressive. They're not the literal colors that pomegranates come in. It's all around the hem of the robe of the priests with gold bells between them. So these ornate, extravagant robes. Well, let's keep seeing what other art in the Bible is acceptable to God. Let's look at the temple itself. If you look on the right-hand side, this upper uh, photo here is actually the pillars of an Egyptian temple. They used lotus flowers for the tops. The very top there, you can see lotus flowers. Uh, it was Solomon's temple, golden laden with heavenly beings depicted, garnished with precious stones and gold, so very lavish and extravagant. Overlaid also the house, the beams, the thresholds, and the walls, all with gold. Just stunning. Carved cherubim in the walls. Angelic beings right there in the heart of the temple. Then we notice the aesthetic, abstract, non-functionary pillars. He erected the pillars in front of the temple. They didn't hold anything up. They're just freestanding columns. They just look beautiful. They didn't need some other justification. Then non-religious subjects to see stood on 12 bulls, three facing north, west, south, east. The sea rested on the top of them, and his rim was like the rim of a cup, like a lily blossom. Now, if you look at the bottom right here of this slide, you'll see these are the 12 bulls. This is what Mormon temples use for their baptistry, their baptism. So they have a big uh, bowl on top of the backs of these oxen, just like in the Old Testament we see here. So this is a bit more modern than would have been back in the day, but large, massive, physical representations of created creatures on the ground, right in the middle of the temple. Look also at the last one, which is heavenly and earthly objects together. The panels had lions, oxen, and cherubim, the same panels, and there were carvings with cherubim and palm trees. So they're a continuing mixture of heavenly things, earthly things, and this is never condemned. The chronicler condemns Solomon for having so many wives that his heart wanders, uh, to worship other gods, but they never say what he did in the temple was wrong. None of the writings, none of the prophets say, behold Solomon, behold David, what you had in the temple, that's what caused all Israel to downfall. Never. Not once. God in his great wisdom never thought it was important to point out anything negative about any of the artwork in the tabernacle in the temple. So it must not have been important. It was not a concern. Sadly, many churches in the recent history have acted like it's a big issue. So what about other art in the Bible? Let's just keep going down here. It was lavish and extravagant. You look at the poetry. There's psalms, oracles, songs of Solomon, prophecies, apocalyptic literature, grandiose, uh, you know, the book of Revelation, some of the visions. Just tremendous, powerful, creative ways to communicate. You look at the music. There's psalms songs and specific directives from God about music. He stationed the Levites in the temple to play music. 
in the temple of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres in the way that described by David, Gad the king's seers, Nathan the prophet. This was commanded by the Lord. Music was not optional. Art was not optional. Just focus on the truth and worship in spirit and truth. And if you need some music to help you, great. No, it was commanded to use music. Art was required. They needed the artists. They needed the musicians. And there's drama. Ezekiel is commanded to do performance art. A uh, fascinating book if you want to read it. Chapter 4, as a, as a symbol of what's going on in Israel, and they're going to be taken off to, Is, uh, to Babylon, Jerusalem destroyed, and so he's got to shave his head, lay on his side, and even cook over his own feces, or what God originally requests, and Ezekiel bargains with God. You can read the passage to get the picture there. But this is shock art. God commissioned Ezekiel to shock the nation. Uh, people act like shock art is some new thing in the last 30 years, 100 years. No, 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 no. You're late to the party. <laughs> shock art was already done by God several thousand years ago. Now, it's like a dance. Let them praise his name with dancing. David danced before the Lord with all his might, of course. Famous passage. And Miriam, the prophetess, and all the women who followed her with tambourines and dancing. And again, all these examples are given with no clarification no warning, no caveat. These are good things from God to be imitated. So let's go back and look at the actual verses in the second commandment. It says, You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Aha! And I've highlighted that text, bolded it to make it easier for you to see. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. The issue is not what's carved. <laughs> and think of it, just honestly, if artwork was that powerful that it caused idolatry, which, if you're really that scared of art, you're saying artwork has more power than almost anything else. It, it, you can't resist it. If you go to the Getty, you go to LACMA, you go to the Guggenheim, uh, the National Gallery, you're going to fall down prostrate and worship Rembrandt's paintings or Rothko or whatever you're standing before. You can't help but worship it, which is ridiculous. You don't go to museums and find people worshiping art. Maybe considering, maybe they're in awe of it, maybe they love it. But they're not worshiping art. They're not bowing down before it. And this is what was happening in Egypt. He's telling his people not to do. So what does this mean? It means idolatry is a heart issue, not an art issue. Our hearts can make idols of money, power, success, fame, accomplishment, praise of man, you name it. As the reformer John Calvin said, our hearts are idol factories. You, all the time you find, oh, I love that, I'll get my identity in that. Oh, I want to look great. I want to have a great Instagram post. I want to have a great life. I want to have that car. That'll make me feel worthy. I want to have a better job. That'll make me feel worthy. And so we make these things that are good things of primary importance, and we turn them into idols. It's not unique to art. We don't need art in order to commit idolatry. The arts can be an opportunity for idolatry, of course. But art is no more special in this regard than temptation to worship money, fame, power, or the praise of man. And I say this in the Institute. I'll just say it here. You know, art doesn't cause idolatry any more that a lazy boy chair causes sloth. Did you get that? Art does not cause idolatry any more than a lazy boy chair causes sloth or a great steak causes gluttony and so on. The seven deadly sins are not caused by something physical. It's in our heart. Jesus tells us our heart is what's sinful. It's not what goes in a man that makes him sinful. It's what comes out. It's what's in your heart that is making it sin. So, the issue is your worship, not your art. So here's the conclusion. God cares deeply about your art. We saw with Bezalel how much he utilized artists at the center, at the very heart of making his own nation. He commissions artists. He brought them and he said, I want you to be at the heart of capturing the imagination of my people. I want art to be at the heart of how I create a new culture that's unique and distinct from Egypt. But I'm not leaving art behind. I'm going to use art for my glory. So let's go through these things. God gave you your creativity and your desire to create. 
Sure, in, in Genesis, God began by creating beauty throughout the earth. It took six days to do it, and he made you in his image. And so all humans, all men and women, are creative. We're created problem solvers, whether we're, we're uh, like the early descendants of Adam and Eve, we're taking care of animals and livestock, or vegetation, creating hybrid plants. My wife and I are at the Huntington Gardens. They have the 100th rose. It's 100th hybrid kind of rose. It's amazing what we do as creative people just with all the resources we have around us. And secondly, God commanded art to be made and his artist to make it. God is not silent about art. He commissioned art and he commissioned artists to be at the center of his nation of Israel. And then God commissioned Bezalel. If you read that passage, his right-hand man is Oholiab. And then they had apprentices from the nation of Israel that they trained to help build. There's a lot, there's a lot to do. Sewing the priestly robes, creating the, the cloth for around the tabernacle, and then creating the Ark of the Covenant with acacia wood and covering it with gold. That's no small trick. So all of this was critically important to God. And then third, God's word, the rest of God's word, presents art as meaningful and acceptable part of all facets of life. A, God's Word gives tremendous examples of art, architecture, dance, literature, poetry, parables, you name it. Secondly, God never condemns art or creativity or artists as inherently dangerous. This is critically important. What the Bible does say is also as important what it does not say. The prophets never condemn the artists. No, Jesus never says, well, that's the Old Testament thing. You don't need to use music anymore. You don't need art in a holy church anymore. You don't need, beauty is not important anymore. That's another sermon. Beauty has always been important. Uh, God never condemns art, creativity, or artists as inherently dangerous at all. And third, the only caveat that we have is don't worship the beauty and art we create. And to that point, some people go, well, Joel, that's great. That's the Old Testament. But everything changes in the New Testament. There's no temple. This is true. But where are we headed? We're headed to a new Jerusalem. And is that new Jerusalem boring? Is it drab? Do God just kind of throw something together? And beauty is not important anymore. And it's not important that we're that we like the environment. No, it's gorgeous. Gold streets with jasper and emerald and diamonds. It's off the charts gorgeous. Beauty never ceases to be important to God. And John Piper has a great point. I remember hearing him speak years ago and I read his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, which is all about evangelism. Uh, and some great points, but he made a very profound point. In heaven, in the New Jerusalem, there'll be more, no more evangelism, no more missions conferences, no more outreach. But we will still be worshiping. We will still need worshipers, songwriters, musicians, and creative people to create new ways to communicate to each other, our love for each other, and our love for God. Artwork is not going to stop. It goes all the way into heaven. So, we did, this, uh, we did this artist forum live. We had some other Q&A, great discussions, uh, why this happened. And I teach that elsewhere. That really it starts from the Reformation on. There's a distrust of art that came out of the Reformation and the issues with the Catholic Church. Both the Reformers and the Counter-Reformers saw problems. And the iconoclasts, uh, their sentiment kind of took hold. And as, as cultures moved on to the Enlightenment, scientific method. Uh, we grew away from appreciation of the physical and focused on worshiping in word and spirit and truth from John chapter 4. Now is the time you'll worship me in spirit and truth. And we just kind of left the arts in the dust. And I would argue it's not biblical. I understand why they did it. But it's not biblically founded. It was culturally influenced. It's time for the church to get back to biblical principles. Embrace the arts and encourage men and women, we need you to create great art in the church, in the culture, to speak to our culture today. Our culture is obsessed with beauty and aesthetics 
and something new and creative to communicate to them. And we should be at the forefront of speaking to them in creative, new, cutting edge ways. So thank you so much for watching this. If you have any comments, put those down below, of course. And that's the end of our talk. So glad you could join us. Uh, if you want to sign up for our newsletter, that'd be great. If you click and subscribe, you'll be the first to know every time we put up a new video. And we're so thankful for that. And we'll put other links if you want to find out. We have online courses, we have blogs, we have videos. And if there's a question you have that you would like us to address, put that in the comments. Our passion is to encourage and equip you to use all your gifts for the glory of God, whether it's in the church, in the mainstream, faith-based, more nuanced, doesn't matter. If you're a man or woman, a child of God, and you have creative gifts, we're here to support and equip you in that journey. So, again, I'm Joel Pelsu with Arts Entertainment Ministries. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. May God bless you and inspire to you to live a life where your faith and your art are integrated as a whole system as you honor God with all your art, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. God bless. Thank you.